Hi, I'm Michael Ken Benoit, and this is Upfront with Shaw TV. Upfront is a political talk show aimed at providing a voice to the local community and at informing them about upcoming political projects, events, and policies. Our guest today is going to be Mayor Bob Simpson. Mayor Bob Simpson has been a resident of Quinell for over 30 years, and he is currently our mayor. Welcome, Mayor Bob Simpson. It's an honor to speak with you here today. So I'd like to jump right into it. This one is, is maybe sort of a softball here, but uh, the topic of our discussion is sustainability. So I'm wondering about your own personal definition of sustainability. Mm. So I, I, I've been writing about sustainability issues. I first moved up to Quinell to teach and I taught science. I, I'm a, I have a degree in biology and a degree in history. Uh, and I started, a, well, I, I was dubbed an environmentalist and I used to argue with people that I wasn't. Uh, I was a, 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 sustain, a promoter of sustainability okay. because I think pure environmentalism is just as bad as pure corporatism. You know, if you're an environmentalist, you get to discount how people make money uh, and, and uh, you know, the, the metal that you're sitting on. I used to uh, argue with my mother-in-law who was really into uh, environmental issues and, and ask her to show me her portfolio that she was banking on her retirement on because <laughs> I'm sure it had Tech Cominco and, you know, other uh, uh, brand names in there that weren't so environmental friendly. Mm -hmm. So I used to promote sustainability, which I think is just a deeper thinking about how we live on the planet and, and not just how we live on the planet, but how we work on that planet and how we engage with each other on, on this planet. It's, it's a very small place in the universe. Mm -hmm. So ultimately that led me to get involved in politics because I think we are living unsustainably because we live on a daily basis just meeting our own needs without forethought for the future. So we discount the future. We discount the future in our decision making. It's one of the toughest things I've got with a council that is predominantly in their later years in their professional careers or have already retired because you know they're they're living for their final years and really at the end of the day we're making the decisions in here that will shape the next 30 to 50 years. And if we make those decisions in a way that narrow options for future generations, we do a great disservice to those generations. So we have to make decisions just now that actually look at the true, what is the long-term sustainability of that decision? Are you opening options? Are you making it possible for people 30 or 50 years from now to live the same quality of life that we live today? And I would argue that 99% of the decisions made by politicians are limiting options. 99% of the commercial and industrial activities that are going on today are limiting options for future generations. We're undermining our water systems. We're undermining our ecological systems throughout the planet. And of course, global warming sitting over top of that is becoming the, you know, the, the elephant in the room where we don't know what that's going to do to future generations. People are right? aware of it, but they're not, they're not taking action. Yeah, and, and so part of the challenge though, on, on that very point, mm -hmm. part of the challenge is to say, okay, it's not enough to say there's a problem. That's the problem I have with environmentalists. They're really good at pointing to the problems, but they don't help us to find the solutions. I had sure. a big argument one time with David Suzuki that. over that because for years he was telling everybody we're going to hell in a handbasket, but never told us how we would change course, <laughs> right? Uh, so I think, again, sitting in the mayor's chair or sitting in a political leadership position, it, it, it's not enough to say, yeah, we have some problems. You've got an obligation to try and figure out what some of the options and solutions are. And for most people, if you take away their hope, by, and I think that's where we are with climate change, we've said climate change is going to kill the planet. Well, might as well eat, drink, and be merry. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, what am I supposed to do about that? Yeah, Whereas if you say to people, look, here's how we can address climate change, or here's how we can minimize our waste, and be really as practical as you can about how people can change their daily lives, yeah. I think that's a greater service uh, to the public. And so yeah. for me, true sustainability in the kind of decision making we have to make is solutions oriented and enabling people to make different choices. Mm -hmm. If those different choices are not enabled, 
then it's very difficult for people to make the changes that you need them to make. Yeah. You have to enable the choices that are alternate choices. Absolutely. Empower the people to basically make the changes that they want to see. And Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. It's not enough just to point out what needs to change. It yeah, needs so, to show. so one of the decisions we made early on as a council uh, as part of our budget, uh, but, it's, but it's because it's, we've got a long game on the, on the go with respect to waste management, for example. Uh, we went to bi-weekly garbage pickup. People were used to weekly uh, garbage pickup. We went to bi-weekly, and there were a lot of people who were complaining uh, about that, but there was a lot of people who say, well, I, I only put my garbage can out once a month or once every six weeks anyway, so why should I pay for weekly service? Yeah. But I had one woman in particular who said, you know, I'm a family of four, uh, you know, family of six, the mom and dad and four kids. We're very active. We've got lots of garbage and everything else. I said, well, think about it differently. So don't don't talk to us about the fact that you're only getting your garbage picked up every two weeks. Sit down as a family and figure out how to reduce your waste. Yeah. So, so we have said we're only doing it uh, every two weeks. You can go buy another garbage can. You can pay an incremental fee for garbage pickup. Mm -hmm. Or you can sit back and as a family figure out how to reduce your waste. Yeah. They figured out how to reduce their waste, right? And she yeah. sent me a Facebook post afterwards saying this was a good exercise for us because you limited some options for us. But then we've got home pickup recycling. You know, we actually invested quite a bit in recycling education to help people out Excellent. to think it through. Yeah. But that's part of a longer game for us because our landfill's filling up. So our landfill's 70% full already. Uh, that's a huge endeavor for us to find a new landfill if it fills up too fast. Mm -hmm. Plus, we're very close on, on having to capture methane because there's a cap on methane released from landfills now where you then have to capture it and you, you're not allowed to release it into the environment. Again, a climate change initiative. So our first step in, in changing people's behaviors with picking up garbage every two weeks is in a long game where we want to become a zero waste community and a full uh, materials recovery community. So we're working towards 2019 to put plans in place to do that. And through that whole process, every step along the way, we want to enable our citizens to make different choices so that when we get to that time, 2019, 2020, and we flick the switch where we're going to be full recovery and zero waste, they're enabled to change their behaviors. So the ones that don't change their behaviors, you know, that's their choice. They're going to pay for that because that's that how that system works. Yeah. But we will have enabled behavior changes, and I think that's where true sustainability at, at a decision-making level mm -hmm. comes in. You've got to enable the ability to change. Certainly, yeah. So that's a specific example of, mm -hmm. of how you are um, enabling the community of Quinell to become more sustainable itself. Right. right, and so I, I know that there are some policies and sort of projects that you've been working on with the city of Cornell to also kind of increase the sustainability of the community for the long term, yeah. uh, such as affordable housing. You, yeah. you touched on the uh, the doctor promotion uh, program. I'm, I'm sure I'm mis misnoming okay. that, but yeah. Uh, yeah, those those are some excellent initiatives. I wonder, are there any others uh, similar, or or would you like to elaborate on well, those? Well, the housing one is a real challenge. It's it's a very interesting one for us because um, we have we have some of the most affordable housing if not the most affordable housing yes. in the province yeah, no both at the at the retail market so house purchases mm -hmm. uh, and uh, on rent but when you actually look at the makeup of our uh, citizens and our residents here we have one of the highest percentages of, of uh, our population that pays over 30% of their household income on housing. Really? So you have to, it, it, these are all, the, this is the deeper thinking that I keep sort of berating council a little bit. You can't stay at the surface, you gotta dig a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. So you have to ask the question, why? why? You know, if we have such affordable housing, why is it that we have such a large proportion of our population that still uh, are over that benchmark 30 percent of their household income going into uh, housing the reason is we have no middle economy so we have the high income earners in the mills and west fraser head office and the hospitals and the school district so we have those high income earners and then we have the service economy uh, that's serving that yeah. we have nothing in the middle 
So a large portion of our population are making minimum wage or slightly above minimum wage, and they're the ones that no matter how affordable your housing is, it's still pretty expensive relative to their income. Yeah. The other piece we have is we have a very old housing stock. So it's aged out. Uh, the, the main housing boom in our community was back in the 1980s. Uh, many of the houses over on the west side, because of the West Cornell land stability issue, haven't been invested in for a long time, haven't been renovated because we have restrictions on building over in that area. So that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece on top of all of that is that we are predominantly single family residential. So we have houses and lots. So you mix all that together and what you've got is you've got a housing stock that's aged and needs investment. Mm -hmm. You've got a housing stock that doesn't meet the needs of today's generation, so seniors who want condos or you know townhouses or row houses, and professionals who I always joke, young professionals don't want to work at work and then work at home. <laughs> you know they want to you know they want to be able to leave work and go get on their mountain bike or their ATV or get on the lake and fish or whatever. Recreation. They don't want to go home and here, yeah. and mow the lawn and shovel snow <laughs> and so on. So and we don't have that housing stock. And then overarching that, we, we have a big chunk of our population that doesn't make enough money, no matter how affordable the housing is. Mm -hmm. So the way that we're addressing that is that uh, we've created a bylaw to incent new investment in housing. So we, we don't charge what are called development cost charges, and that's the cost for a new development to tie into your sewer and water and road infrastructure. Okay. So if you come to us with the right kind of housing that's different than what we've got and meets our needs, we don't mm -hmm. charge you that. And that's a pretty significant wow. chunk of money. Absolutely. Uh, and that's for the west side and for North Cornell as the targeted areas. Yeah. We also will give 10-year tax forgiveness, so property tax forgiveness, again, if it's the right kind of development mm -hmm. uh, in our downtown core and five years over in the west side. So that's a direct cash incentive to get the kind of housing that we need. Uh, and we're looking for affordable, accessible, adaptable housing, people with disabilities, seniors, uh, low-income earners, et cetera, on our first pass. But we would like to get into market housing as well, so higher-end housing that people who can afford it but want to get out of the single-family residential situation into condominiums. Yeah. The other piece we're doing is we need to enable secondary suites in all of the houses that we've got. So while a home may be affordable in Quenelle, a young couple is still going to struggle to get a mortgage to afford that house. And more and more what they're looking for is a legal secondary suite or a mortgage helper suite. Mm -hmm. For seniors who are on fixed income, their ability to stay in their home uh, because their income is fixed, all the prices all go up, becomes more difficult for them. Yeah. So again, a mortgage helper or a, you know, an income helper, having a secondary suite in their home helps that. Quinnell doesn't enable secondary suites just now for a whole bunch of political reasons, wow. so we need to move in that direction. Sure. Then the other piece on top of that with the existing housing stock is we're going to put in place what's called a maintenance bylaw. So the maintenance bylaw will have the minimum standards, there's about 12 standards that we would regard as the minimum quality housing standards we would like to see in all of our rental housing and in all of the housing that's available in the market. Okay, here. and so what would you do in the case of uh, someone that fell below that level? So again, it would be a complaint-driven process by, uh, uh, by the resident, mm -hmm. uh, and it's mostly targeted at rental. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so uh, if they put a complaint in, our building inspector would actually go over there and write it up to the code. Mm -hmm. Now, for illegal suites, which we've got lots of, a person can get a certificate for that illegal suite. So they don't have to meet the legal standards for a legal suite, okay. but if they meet our maintenance standard, then they can get what's called a non-conforming suite designation, which then helps them with their property values and so on. So it does a double fold, yeah. the, the, uh, double uh, duty for us. Mm -hmm. The main thing is, is we completely understand that for Quinnell to be truly sustainable, to attract and retain residents and, and, and investors in our community, we need a different housing stock, we need to improve the quality of the housing stock we have, yeah. and we need different housing options for people. And council has been very active in, in taking the lead on that. Mm -hmm. The previous housing strategy we had when I became mayor, it had just timed out, it, it had been developed five years before, there were a whole bunch of goals and objectives in it, none of them were met 
because it took a dispersed leadership. So it was kind of, you know, the community is going to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, the new housing strategy we have, it says council is going to lead this. And so we're putting the tools in place. We're attracting the dollars. So we'll have, uh, starting this summer, uh, we'll break ground on three brand new multi-unit housing complexes in the city. This uh, summer? This summer. There'll wow. be about, uh, just over 100 brand new units of housing available for seniors, people with disabilities, some transition housing as well. So it's been a great success story for us on that side. And I've started to get ca calls from developers who are now looking at the market side because we do have affluent people here who would like to shift out of single family residences into something different. Okay. And so we'll work with those developers to get that kind of housing as well. Absolutely, yeah, the housing is essential, right? You need, Absolutely. You need the people yeah. to uh, be enabled to have the opportunity to live in sort of standardized housing, right? And that yeah. also kind of provides more opportunity for people coming into the community yeah. as well, right? So to know that there is a certain level of Absolutely. quality. And, Absolutely. We, yeah. I mean, we live in a, in a you know, one of the half acre lots, large house up in South Hills. And I keep saying to my wife, you know, I turned 60 last fall. It's time to get me a place that I can <laughs> not work at home. I can go play as well. But there's not lots of options for us, right? Yeah. So, you know, to move from that big garden and big lot, where do, where do you move into? So mm -hmm. you look at a small footprint house in North Quinnell or so on, but you still have all of the same things you need to do. Uh, you know, I, I have a sailboat in Victoria. We like to go down there for three, four, five weeks if we can get mm -hmm. away. You got to find a house sitter, you so on. So, yeah. you know, at certain stages in your life, you just need to have a different, if you want to stay in Quinnell, it would be nice to have a condominium or a townhouse or someplace mm -hmm. to call home here and then have the freedom to do the kinds of things you want to, but yeah. this is still your home base. And it's not just the young people who, who like to have fun, right? And so yeah. you touched a little bit on the, the walking trails, right? Yeah. So I know that that's um, something that, that you've been looking into as well. Yeah. Is that something you might want to elaborate? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to me, uh, that's been a big miss over the years. So, uh, you know, I've been a competitive mountain biker and, and runner for a long time, and we have phenomenal trails around Cornell. I used to train uh, for one uh, mountain bike race down in Squamish Whistler area wow. uh, and uh, we, we would ride a hundred kilometers on trails uh, from Dragon Mountain to Melbourne Mountain and we would touch pavement for about six kilometers, right? <laughs> so we have the trail system uh, but it's never been developed, never been mapped and GPSed and, and really marketed well. Mm -hmm. And you look at a community like Williams Lake that's put a lot of effort into particularly their mountain bike trails, yeah. and now they've become a mountain bike mecca. They held one of the biggest premier mountain bike shows, I think it was last summer or the summer before. Uh, they hold mountain bike races, mm -hmm. and, so, and, and they can promote that aspect to their community. So what we're, what we're doing, we're just uh, in the process of, of starting it just now, we're going to do uh, what's called a master trails strategy. Okay. And as I was saying before, it's not just for the non-mechanized or motorized users. What we would like to do is take a Quinnell in the fringe area mm -hmm. and map all of the different trails options we have available and then start talking to the different groups about where we could do dedicated specialized trail systems and where we can do common cooperative uh, trail systems that maybe interlink uh, those. Mm -hmm. So the ATV snowmobile group uh, just out the Barkerville Highway have an area they have been developing. Uh, the Pony Club has an area out uh, the uh, Nazco Highway. You know, the mountain bike uh, folks have done some stuff up above Dragon Lake and up uh, Dragon Mountain where we have a new park. Mm -hmm. So mapping those specialty areas, but then as I say, sitting and saying, okay, now can we link some of those so you can run from one to another on combined trails and how do you develop those trails? Mm -hmm. um, I, I was down in Seattle last year <laughs> and they have a little lake in one of their subdivisions and around the lake they have a, a fairly wide trail that goes around. The inside is a pea gravel type trail for runners that don't want to run on the pavement. Okay. Then they have the pavement trail. Then they have a horse trail on the outside wow. edge of it. So they have actually taken the same trail system and mm -hmm. developed it for multi-use so that you don't have that uh, cross use that causes the trails not to be really well suited to anybody. Yeah. So our desire is to get that master trail strategy nailed down mm -hmm. and then to go after the significant funding available through real rural dividend or northern trust, et cetera, and really chew over the next five years 
getting those trails up to whatever the standards are, the horse standards or the mountain bike standards or the ATV standards, yeah. really uh, marketing uh, them uh, so that we attract more visitors. And I think through attracting visitors who come here, especially people involved in e-commerce or people who are close to retirement, uh, people can cash out uh, from the lower mainland, uh, they come up here and they realize that you know, they, if they have to get in the car, they're getting in the car for 10 minutes to get to the trailhead, not you know, a 45 minute to an hour and a half commute to get to the trailhead. Just to get to work sometimes, yeah, and right? to we some, take that for granted. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so that trail system becomes a real tool for us to uh, truly diversify our economy. Mm -hmm. And then we have to train at the end of it, and we've been talking to some of our business partners, at the end of it, you have to train your business community to, to engage in that trail system and become ambassadors for it. I was down in Williams Lake uh, last year and talking to a friend that I, I race with. We do this uh, Tour de Caribou bike race every year, and I was down bugging him about whether he's ready to go or not. And, <laughs> and uh, this young uh, group came in. It was uh, two guys and a girl came in, and uh, he said, you know, excuse me. And he's just a businessman down there, and they said, we, we hear you guys have great trails. And he says, yeah. And he says, what kind of bikes have you got? What's your level of skill? What kind of uh, experience do you want to have? And then he was able to pull the trail map out and based on getting a little bit of intelligence from them, say, okay, here's the three trails I would recommend. Yeah. It'll take you about four hours. Here's where you start and here's where you can finish. Mm -hmm. And by the way, at the end of it, you can have a beer at the Laughing Loon uh, and wet your whistle <laughs> before you move on. That's the kind of ambassadors we need to grow in our own community once we have the system set up. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's another addition uh, to our community that I think really helps with us diversifying the economy, yeah. but also attracting and retaining our residents and visitors. Definitely. Yeah, so we've sort of touched on a few projects that, uh, that are upcoming now, right? So are there any other major upcoming projects that uh, would tie in nicely with the sustainability effort? Um, how many hours have you got? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got lots on the go. One, one of the ones I'm excited about, and it's a bit, it's a bit goofy because I don't, my, my kids are all growing up, but our investment in playgrounds is going to oh, be sure. really fun, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So we, we have two new playgrounds as of last year, one up at the recreation center that's uh, more designed around accessibility and autism and so on. Uh, so it's a, it's a specialty uh, playground. And then we invested in the West Fraser Timber Park, a brand new playground in there. This year, we'll be investing in a brand new state-of-the-art playground in Laborde Park. Okay. And that has a number of, of uh, reasons. It's a very aged-out playground in our premium park where we hold all of our festivals. It's a highlight, yeah. Right? So, you know, whether it's Aboriginal Day or Canada Day or, or uh, you know, uh, the uh, new show and shine that's in there, Billy Barker Days, that playground is heavily used, mm -hmm. and it's so aged-out. Like, it just does not present uh, our community well. Uh, to young families and so many of those young families are visiting and potentially thinking about moving to Quinnell and we have this aged out playground. So we will be putting in a brand new playground uh, there this year and part of our new branding initiative is that we want to be trailblazers. So we will be the third community in North America to have embedded trampolines into the play area. So wow. they'll be right ground level of different sizes sure. and they'll be just really fun as well as brand new uh, equipment and swings and all of that stuff. So, sure. so that'll be a premium one for us. But again, that playground allows us to market ourselves differently. So one of the things that happened in our, we're doing, redoing our official community plan. Our official community plan for all communities is, is a requirement of the provincial government. And it really takes a look at your out years. Uh, so we're planning out to 2030. In that official community plan review, the, so the preliminary work done by the consultants, one of the consultants said to us, uh, you know, you, you're known as a beautiful community to drive through. <laughs> Are you comfortable with that? Sightseeing, I suppose there's value in it. Well, but, but he said, have you ever, you know, has the city of Cornell ever marketed itself as a destination and no we haven't mm -hmm. but then that begs the question of okay what's the x factor that you're trying to market people to plan to come to Quinnell for yeah. so you have to really think that through mm -hmm. so you'll see over the next little while our, our wayfind what they call wayfinding signage or highway signage will start to say things like stop and play in Quinnell 
And if you have a premium playground in your main downtown park, right beside your visitor center, where people can get information about your community, and you can make that a known spot, we're on the through fair to Alaska, up to the Peace, the Peace people going down to the Okanagan or to Vancouver. I know when we used to travel with our kids, we'd stop at 100 Mile House all the time because they'd get a, a cool little park that's hidden off to the side with a waterfall. And, our, and you know it got known that's it was about two hours kids needed a pee break we needed a break from them let them run <laughs> you know and let them go up uh, to play around in the park mm -hmm. so we want that playground to be known so that kids will tell their parents that's where we're stopping and they stop in Cornell even right? just a, a park that is a place to, to relax yeah on the, on but, the road, it, but if you have the features stuff, that you can really promote and mm -hmm. we've never promoted the riverfront trail the same way next year we will be investing in a complete refresh of our riverfront trail mm -hmm. it's part of the foundation piece for our master trails uh, strategy okay uh, but then you'll see signage you know stop and walk uh, and we'll we're, we're deliberately going to reset some of the parking so people on the highway can actually stop and get on our riverfront trail and walk. So the other playground we're going to do is up in South Hills and it will be a nature play area. Okay. So the other piece that we want to do with our playgrounds is we want each one of them to be unique. We've added playgrounds into our five-year capital plan just like our roads, just like our water system and our sewers, mm -hmm. because they're a fundamental attraction uh, for us, for younger families that we need for our community to be sustainable. We would like to eventually get a playground map that again at our visitor center or our stores when people are visiting, they can promote our playgrounds as a really cool, unique feature in our community. Mm -hmm. And we would like all of our kids, w regardless of where they live, to know all of the playgrounds and they'd be saying, you know, mommy, I want to go to the nature play area or mom, I want to go to the trampolines or mom, I want to go to the big red slide. Because that, from a sustainability perspective, yeah. really integrates your community so that they understand the community as a whole, not their isolated little uh, neighborhood. Let's get those parks in the ground and the trampolines bouncing. Let's bounce back as a community, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. So at this point, I would like to throw it to some uh, community questions from the local public here in Quinell. My wife and I have owned a business in downtown Quinell for over eight years and we very much love growing our business, interacting with our customers, and watching our business improvement area grow and flourish. My question for you, Mr. Mayor, is what do you think the downtown core will look like in 2019? And then my follow-up would be, what is your vision of, the, of downtown Quinell in the next 30 years? Thank you. That question came from Mitch Vick, who is a local business owner. And so he was interested in uh, development as far as Reed Street mm -hmm. and sort of over the next few years, I think you referred to 2019, what would Reed Street look like at that point? As well, he also mentioned a long-term goal, yeah. keeping in tone with the sustainability. So over the next 30 years, what can we yeah. expect to see in Reed Street? So, and, and Mitch has been involved in this uh, program. And, and again, Mitch is one of those uh, community-minded individuals who really understands that longer-term planning horizon that we're trying to work on. So we have a major project uh, on Reed Street for 2018. Okay. We've started the consultation in February of 2017. So we've taken a, a long window to talk to people about that project because whenever you do major projects in retail areas, it's very disruptive. Uh, there are some businesses that end up not surviving. They don't manage their way through it. Mm -hmm. So we have been very deliberate in trying to work with each of the businesses. I've walked all of the businesses. I intend to walk it a few more times. And what I'm trying to do is work with each of the businesses to have their work around plans ready because we want a liaison team in our new community uh, washroom and promotion space that if, I have a, if I'm a customer and I want to know how to access my business, but that's where the construction is occurring, mm -hmm. I know a place I can go where they can tell me, am I going through the back door or is it, you know, is that down for three days because okay. we're pouring sidewalk, so whatever the case resources, may be. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that we, we try and maintain the health of those businesses and make sure those businesses survive it because it's quite disruptive. So the, the project is a water main project. It's a 60-year-old water main, and it's starting to fail. Uh, and so it's one of those situations where you can wait for it to fail, in which case you have no control over how long the project's going to be, how disruptive it's, it's going to be, or you can get in there and replace it yeah. and manage the disruption, and that's what we're uh, doing. 
But because the water main is so deep, you actually almost have to go sidewalk to sidewalk to open up a hole under the new WCB regulations for working uh, below the surface. Okay. So that gives us the opportunity to reinvent the streetscape of Reed Street. Mm. Now, I, I would argue we have, we have one of the best uh, downtown retail spaces uh, in the province and, and in particularly small communities. Mm -hmm. It's remained vibrant, and it's remained vibrant because councils in the past have stated that the financial institutions and the medical centers have to stay in the downtown core. They haven't allowed them to go up uh, to South Hills or over to the west side. So you have to come into town to do your banking. You have to come into town and see your doctor. So that's anchored that retail uh, area. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, improving it will revive those businesses afterwards. Definitely. What we're asking is, what changes do we want to make? And, and I joked uh, with the retailers, because we've done six consultations now on this, that they have to get their heads into the long game, and that's what Mitch is talking about, that 20, 30, and beyond. Yeah. I joked with them that, you know, who knows what the modes of transportation are going to be uh, even 10 years from now. Yeah. Uh, Dubai this year is introducing self-piloted drone taxis. My goodness. And the struggle they're having is where do those taxis <laughs> land? So you call a taxi up, it comes, it lands, you get in, it flies you where you want to go. Where we're going, we don't need roads, eh? Let's get well, some elephants. Well, so that's the issue, right? So, so in that planning horizon, we're planning for a real change in the mode of transportation. In Quenelle, we've already experienced a fairly significant uptick in cyclists, in people in mobility devices, and in people walking. If you look at Bryce Trail connecting South Quinnells into downtown on any given day, and I often sit in places just to watch what's going on over a period of time, you see more and more people walking in and out. Uh, you know, people who work at the school district head office and live in South Hills will walk into work, right? So, so we have to plan that whole streetscape with that in mind. Mm -hmm. Bigger sidewalks, uh, a place where people come to and feel comfortable. And that's the challenge that we have with the retail folks is how do you do that? Because for them, we, we have a, a, an accommodation to people who like to park right in front of the store that they want to do business in, right? That's been the history in Quenelle of I can park in front of my store. In fact, we it's watched one. Unique, yeah. We watched yeah. one guy the other day there. We were down in Reed Street, and he was parked in front of ABC Communications. He came out of there, got in his car, drove his car up to Home Hardware, and did his business in Home Hardware, and then drove up to the post office and did his business. And you're going, seriously? Like, you know. Bit uh, so, so we've got to deal with that issue. So it's going to be a really fun project. We're, we're actually close to some of the design concepts. We'll, we'll, there'll be more plazas along the lines of, of the... Um, Spirit Square embedded, uh, bigger sidewalks, mm -hmm. the ability uh, down where Mr. Mike's in that area is for all of those smaller restaurants to actually have a sidewalk cafe type uh, area because we, can, we think we can put a very wide sidewalk in there. Be very nice. And then we're going to be addressing all of the accessibility issues that we have because all of our stores have a lip uh, just now that's very difficult for people to get in and out of. Mm -hmm. So we have a new partnership with the Downtown Business Association where we were able to get them dollars to change to accessible doors. So they'll either have slide doors or the push button doors that open. Okay. And when we do the Reed Street project, we'll, we'll lift where we can so that there's no lip there as well. Mm -hmm. And we're working with those businesses to deal with accessibility inside because it's no good getting a person into the store and then they can't move around on your store. Yeah. So we're working with them and we have a, a new a person that we're just bringing on that is going to be doing demonstrations and and some uh, tutorials on on how to change their business. Very cool. So that downtown, I think, will 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 take what is a good downtown and will notch it even further. Mm -hmm. But the longer term vision that Mitch is talking to is is that's part of a threefold vision that we have for our downtown precinct, our downtown area. In conjunction with the Reed Street area, and, and we'll extend that to other parts of our downtown retail space, and, and we're also having conversations with the West Side Business Association about some of those people-centric uh, redevelopments going over there as well, okay. different sidewalks, different crosswalks, uh, different lighting uh, too. Uh, so we want to take uh, the highway, and we're working with Ministry of Transportation, and reconfigure the highway as much as possible, try and get a bunch of the truck traffic off, get the highway off Carson Avenue, where it is just now, down onto Legion Drive both ways, okay. and free that whole south end 
of our downtown core for more development than, than what we've got just now. It's more comfortable driving, right? If yeah, right off well, and, and you don't have that T-junction at, at Front and Reed Street that's a problem. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll come off, off the bridge and go up. Mm -hmm. And then we want to uh, moderate the, the number of stops and starts on, on Front Street as well so that traffic can move smoother. If we can get some more of the trucks off of Front Street and make it move smoother, then places like the Occidental and the Caribou and others may consider, and they've been long asked, a patio type experience so that they, people can actually sure. enjoy the river uh, mm -hmm. while they have a meal, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. then, and so that's the second piece. And the third piece is the development of the river bench. Trying to get people down on the, on the river bench, that river bench is owned by the city. Okay. So it's developable property. You have to take into consideration floodplain and various things like that. So, you know, can we get people down there to have a coffee or a light meal? Can we work with Barkerville Brewery or others to get them down there so they can enjoy, you know, a quiet beer or a glass of wine as they enjoy the river or the sunset? So that's a challenge we've taken on. As part of that, though, we're working with the Latako Dene, uh, First Nation Red Bluff uh, Indian Band, because that is, uh, the city is all their traditional territory. Mm -hmm. uh, they lived here. In fact, at one point, uh, the Red Bluff Indian Band had 15,000 people living in a smaller footprint than what we call the city of Cornell, and the city is less than 10,000 people today. So oh. they, it's their territory, and there's mass oh. graves all over and, uh, and the area because of smallpox, et cetera. So one area that we're very interested in is what's currently called Seal Tingley Park. Uh, which is uh, of very special, special significance to the Latako because Latako means where the three rivers meet, the Quenelle, the Fraser, and Baker coming from the other side. Okay. So we've engaged with them in a conversation about whether or not we can take that area called Seal Tingley Park and turn it into an Aboriginal cultural center that reflects the Red Bluff Indian Band, but also the Southern Carrier Nation as well. Mm. So then people are down on the river, not just experiencing the river and being able to enjoy it, but they can also have a cultural experience that ties them back into the true heritage of our area. So for me, that's transformative, and it, not just, it doesn't just transform your downtown area. As I said, it transforms your west side because it's within walking uh, distance of, of the riverfront uh, trail as well, and, yeah. and it goes on that back side there. So I think that that really creates an opportunity for people to come to town deliberately to do a whole bunch of things and, and then drives into our retail sector. Certainly, that beautification. I, I'm mm -hmm. personally very excited to see the community over the next, you know, 20 to 30 years. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Exciting time to be a, a resident of Cornell. Yeah. So I'd like to throw it to a question from Crystal Brecky, who is a local community member. I work at Axi Family Access Family Resources here in Quinell. Um, one of the things I do is I work with high-risk youth, um, trying to get them living independently. Um, one of the biggest hurdles I've noticed is finding housing. Housing, affordable housing for these youth is almost impossible to find um, or safe to find. I'm, I know Prince George has a facility dedicated just for their youth up there. I'm wondering if the city of Quinell has any plans in its future to provide sustainable housing for our youth. So Crystal was talking about the local youth and about um, some support efforts that may be in place or may be in place in the future to support the local youth via housing. She mm -hmm. used the example of the Prince George mm -hmm. housing initiative there. So one of the challenges we are ultimately going to have as a council is does the city of Cornell, so, so council manage, uh, it's the weirdest thing and it's hard for people to understand. You elect a council People have community expectations of council. But one of the primary functions of council is managing a corporation called the city of Cornell. And that corporation uh, has, uh, has a financial balance sheet that has to be managed. It's within the box of what's called the community charter that we operate. Uh, so we're restrained by the provincial government. And, and the normal expectations of that corporation are that you deliver good quality public services, snow clearing, fire, police, you know, our airport's part of that, parks, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. Garbage pickup, landfilling. 
The minute you try and stretch out of that to meet some of the community needs, which is what Crystal is talking about, so we have a community need, mm -hmm. which is youth housing, yeah. you then really are, are, have, a, uh, have a strange dynamic that you have to manage because many councillors believe that they're, they're here to manage the public purse and make sure that the normal corporate activities are delivered well to the community. You then turn around and say, well, should we use property taxation that we collect to then deal with a community need, which is youth housing? That's a big stretch uh, for them to take on. Mm -hmm. Many communities are starting to do that. The problem for a lot of the councillors is they see it as provincial and federal downloading to the municipality. So you really walk a fine line. It's a tough one. Like I, I totally get Crystal's request and, and we feel it too and again it's part of a community sustainability is if you don't have the right housing if you're not meeting the needs of your entire demographic you're not a sustainable community right Balance again, eh? yeah. yeah so so I, I think council will be evolving over the next little while to think about being more deliberate and more proactive one of the ways that we can do that is we have lots of land and so we have developable land that's owned by the city so some of the dialogue we've had is, can we make that land available in conjunction with our other s incentives so that you get over the, uh, over the hump of, of a return on investment for a developer to come in and develop the kind of housing that you need? In the case of youth housing, can we incent BC Housing, which is the responsible agency for the province, to consider Quinell the place for a youth housing complex with provincial money if we put land and we put some tax incentives on the table. So that's the area where you're, you're walking that fine line, but it allows council to be more deliberate about trying to incent the federal and provincial governments to choose us as the community to invest in. Crystal's other question though is, is really around youth engagement and, and you know, how do we deal particularly youth at risk. Mm -hmm. So we have another initiative going on with the school district. Uh, we're starting to meet with them uh, on a biannual basis to talk about our shared concerns in our community because if our youth aren't served uh, well and, and if, we're, if we are not meeting the needs of the families that have those young people, uh, then we can get at cross purposes because you can get kids going into school that are not ready to learn. Kids are not ready to learn. They start acting out. They act out. They're out of school and then they're on the street and, and you know, council and the city inherit them as a problem as opposed to an asset in our community. So we are working jointly to try and figure out areas that we have in common, uh, uh, where can we work together to make sure that our youth are really well served and that every young person going through our, our school system is engaged in our community in a meaningful way and becomes a successful adult. As part of that, the work we're doing with our First Nations is critical as well. Mm -hmm. And the term I use, particularly for First Nations, is pride of self and pride of place. You know, I think it's that restoring, and it goes for all youth, but particularly First Nations, where we've, you know, Quinell's been a laggard. We, we don't recognize uh, Latakodeni in any of our uh, civic properties. We have no reconciliation initiatives with First Nations to date. We hope to change all of that by Aboriginal Day this year. But for Aboriginal youth, that sense that they can have pride, this is their place. Uh, this is their people's place, then, and that pride of place becomes pride of self, then I think you cut out a lot of the issues that put kids at risk that, that you're then coming in after the fact and saying, what's the housing need? What's the mental health addictions need that you have to address? Mm -hmm. Try and nip it in the bud yeah. in the first place. Yeah. So we want to be proactive in trying to make sure that we're not creating generational issues, that you have to come in and provide the supports. But at the same time, Crystal's right, we need to be providing the supports as well. So we're, we're working to try and uh, have Seasons House move from where it currently is. It will become a transition housing complex with supported transition housing. Once we've got that uh, underway, then we know we need to look at the youth housing issue. We've had some preliminary conversations about it. How we get into it, I'm not clear yet, but we absolutely understand it's a need in our community. Thank you. And the, the next question here is from Michelle Godfrey, who is a CNC student union member. Hi, my name is Michelle Godfrey and I'm a full-time student at the College of New Caledonia here in town. And one thing that I have noticed being on the student union is that uh, 
part of the campaign that we're trying to, that we just got the city to endorse is don't close the doors and that has to do with adult basic education. So all grants and funding has been taken away by the provincial government for adult basic education. So our enrollment here at the Cornell campus has now dropped by 30%. So my question to you, Mr. Bob Simpson, is how, what are you going to do to help bring those enrollment numbers back up and help our education system? And what is the education system going to do towards our sustainability of our community here in Cornell? So Michelle was talking about the adult education cuts that happened recently. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, I believe that she was wondering, um, what are some things that are being done to sort of um, support adults who are looking to transition careers and looking mm -hmm. to start up a new uh, educational career? Yeah, and I think the other part of Michelle's question as well is, is that the role that that combined campus, the college and university has in, in our community as well, and they're of a kind. So Michelle and her group actually made a presentation recently to council about the cuts to adult basic education and, and it's not so much cuts, it's the fact that there's now fee uh, for that. Uh, it used to be free, uh, and it used to be free even if you had a grade 12 education, but you wanted to do upgrading in advance of going into a program, uh, you accessed adult basic education through the K-12 system uh, without a charge. Mm -hmm. Now there's a charge put on that, and we're seeing quite a significant drop in people accessing the program. To me, I think that that's you know, a, a completely uh, inappropriate move on the part of the provincial government to do that and it's very short-sighted. Uh, I moved up here originally to teach and I taught the adult uh, basic education evening uh, programs and many of the people that were in those programs were people who were working uh, often nominal uh, jobs uh, uh, with uh, you know minimum wage and slightly better who were trying to better themselves uh, who would come in and take you know chemistry 12 and biology 12 in, in order to get into the nursing program or take a social studies or history or English in order to get into the social work program mm -hmm. so they were putting all of their sweat equity in after hours and juggling babysitters in order to make the transition in their life uh, and at that time there's no fee so you didn't put a, a cost barrier to add insult to injury they at least got it for free and then they would go on to the nursing program, and I know many of the people that I taught uh, during the times many years ago now uh, are nurses in our community or social workers in our community. By putting that cost barrier up there, you're really saying to people, we're not, we're not going to invest in you and allow you to invest in yourself with your own sweat equity, and I think it's short-sighted. Yeah. But it's doubly short-sighted in our community because we're in transition. You know, and each time we've had a mill closure, we've had to get people into those programs to upgrade their skills to be able to move on to whatever their next technical uh, trades course is or their next career path. And to, to have the uncertainty we have just now where mill workers may want to start doing some presumptive upgrading if they think uh, that their you know, mill may not be there or they want more certainty in their career, but they're going to have to pay for uh, it now, it's a disincentive for them to get involved in the program. Mm -hmm. So it's very short-sighted. With respect to the college, uh, I mean, that is a huge asset uh, for our community. And we need more people who are taking advantage of the programs there. We have a phenomenal trades program up there. It's going to be expanded. Our nursing program and social work program at the university is phenomenal. We have ongoing conversations with both the college and the university about how we can work with them to get even more programs there. Uh, the biggest piece that we can deliver as a council is on the housing side, so part of our secondary suite enabling so that students have safe, secure, quality housing to live on while they go to that campus. There is something that we can offer to that. But certainly at a time when we're going through a transition, we need all opportunities for economic development uh, to be firing on all cylinders, and that college campus is one of those. I see. So our final question is from Deb Burton of the West Quinnell Business Association. We've been working closely with the city the last couple of years on improvements to the skate park, the expansion and improvements to Baker Creek Park. But West Quinnell has had our challenges over the last couple of years. The road construction of the summer of 2016 and there's a lot of vacant commercial space in West Quinnell as well. So how is the city able to help us with uh, 
business sustainability for West Quinnell moving forward. So Deb was asking the question about um, West Quinnell and the businesses in that community. So I'm wondering what you would have to say to mm -hmm. supporting business initiative in West Quinnell. Yeah, and, and of course the biggest issue that we've had over in West Quinnell is, is, uh, is the sense that West Quinnell is our lower income area and it's our, it's our area that has the least investment in it and, you know, a high crime, all of that, right? So the first thing that we've had to do is invest in the land stability issue over there because that's the number one impediment to people investing in their homes or their businesses over there mm -hmm. if they're in the slide area. Yeah. So uh, we just are in the process of completing phase two uh, of that investment. So all in, about $20 million will have been spent uh, in order to stabilize that slide area. And you know, touch wood, it looks like it's working. We'll be taking the new data that we have from 2016, which was a very wet, wet year. Uh, we'll be taking that to the public very shortly here and showing them that we are making pretty substantive progress in stabilizing that slide. We still need a few more years of data to justify opening up the opportunities for people to invest, to renovate their homes, rebuild and some of the, um, some of the businesses over there. The other piece though that we're trying to do is to invest in West Quinnell that to get more people over there to do more things and to understand that West Quinnell is a great part of our community. So this year, there's an old rink, uh, uh, an ice rink over there on Lewis Drive. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah, we'll be investing in, in uh, that. Uh, we'll be turning it into an all-season hard court uh, surface. Okay. So three-on-three -three basketball and long court basketball, lacrosse. Uh, the roller derby girls want to go over there and use it for outdoor practice. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the investments will also make it a better rink uh, in the winter. And we've also targeted it. There's, we have a building, a city building over there that we currently use for storage. Uh, that we would like to then uh, replace that with it more of a community center. Oh. So that whole Lewis Rink area where we took the brown cabins down uh, over there as well, that will be a revitalized area right beside the community gardens. Mm -hmm. The other piece, and it was in the, the clip with Deb, uh, is the skateboard park. So we have already put out a request for proposals and we have a, a, an engineering firm and a skateboard design firm uh, that will be uh, redesigning the skateboard park and it's our intent to invest in that. That's the beginning of a complete reinvestment in Baker Creek Park because as part of the West Quinnell Land Stability Project we, we've got all the land around the Elks Hall on the other side of Baker Creek from the Baker Creek Park and where the skateboard park is. Mm -hmm. So we now have a planning uh, uh, exercise we're going to do this year to replan Baker Creek Park on both sides of the creek and ideally, we'd like to uh, join the two with a new pedestrian-only bridge, so pedestrian cyclist bridge okay. that ties people into our riverfront trail so they don't have to go up on to Anderson Drive and, and cross there. Creating one of those sort of uh, stopping points. Right? Yeah, absolutely, like absolutely. And, and so we've talked with Deb, you know, can we do, there's, there's a bit of a natural amphitheater in the area behind the Elks Hall. Could that be a natural kind of staging area? Because... Deb is phenomenal over there at, uh, at working with the business community to run evening events and uh, trade shows and all kinds of stuff. So can we enable that? Uh, some, some washrooms in that area as well and then making sure that park is a safe place, well lit, and that people will congregate there. And it probably another target for another playground once we get through the ones that we've got. So we'll develop that area. But as part of our official community plan process, that West Quinnell, the Anderson Drive area, is explicitly targeted for us thinking about how we redesign it, do some housing densification. Mm -hmm. So some of the commercial space that she's talking about that stay empty all the time is a mismatch between the kinds of franchise investments that you get in a community and the space that's available. And unfortunately, a lot of that space was built before a lot of these franchises that you see all over the place were, were coming into small towns like ours. So that they don't often like that kind of space. So the question we're asking is, can you take some of that space and turn it into housing? Can you get some densification along Anderson Drive 
that's housing that brings more customers inherently into the businesses that you do have there, the restaurants, and then into the West Park Mall. I see. So we'll be engaging the West uh, Quinnell Business Association in that dialogue about the official community plan and get a three to five year plan for more incremental investments over there. I know that Deb wants different sidewalks. She wants us to do our flower arrangements differently, uh, different crosswalks. We've added a couple of new crosswalks there. So, but do them differently and you know bring them up a little bit and pizzazz and, <laughs> and some painting and so on. So, and we're all in. We we want to do that with them. And as I said, as part of our downtown investment and part of our river trail investment, I think West Quinnell will benefit from that as well because it's such a short walking distance and if we tie those two areas in together and get people moving back and forward then both of those uh, business groups will uh, benefit from that certainly and that that ties in wonderfully with our our topic which is sustainability right and and that balance through the all aspects of the community and the segments and the and the different groups in Quinell yeah. and basically having them provide a unity to the community absolutely that seems so essential nowadays right and, and it's wonderful to hear yep. the initiatives that the city of quinell are doing to to become more sustainable as a whole absolutely so bob if if uh some of our audience would like to get more information about some of the topics that we've been discussing or about the city of quinell in general mm -hmm. where where could they look well my uh email address is simple mayor at quinell.ca and uh, all my contact information is on the city website uh, our economic development officer, Amy Reed, is always happy to answer questions about a lot of our initiatives. She has our branding initiative as well as our community economic development initiatives. And I think most people who have engaged our staff at City Hall, whether it's Tanya down in our development services or our city man manager Byron, or if they have tax questions talking to Carrie, they find that our staff is really helpful on that. So uh, just visit the city website. All of the contact information is there and mo most of as would be uh, you know getting back to you very very quickly uh, to answer your questions wonderful and Good. thank you very much for being with us Happy here to today do this. Bob. thanks great to meet you so if you would like to provide any questions comments or ideas for upfront please contact us at our website here that is Shaw TV at sjrb.ca thank you and good night